Hi, I'm here today to talk to you about how we use data to manage the ocean. Now, a lot of people think we have a lot of data about the ocean, but when you think about how big the ocean is, how massive it is, 1.35 billion cubic kilometers, you start to realize what a challenge we have before us if we want to collect enough data to manage the ocean. So what I want to talk to you today about is how we use ocean data to manage the ocean and why we need more ocean data. Virtually every kind of ocean management requires data, whether we're trying to manage shipping or offshore wind, fishing, biodiversity, sustainable coastlines, you name it, you can't do it unless you have ocean data. One of the things that makes managing the ocean particularly complicated is it's always changing, and it's changing faster now than ever, thanks in large part due to climate change. Climate change and the emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases cause three kinds of change in the ocean at a minimum. Oceans are becoming warmer, oceans are holding less oxygen, and oceans are becoming more acidic. And these three factors combined make it more difficult to manage the ocean. Sea level rises are changing, coral reefs are bleaching. We have more and more blooms of algae, um, many times toxic algae. Habitats for animals are changing. Animals depend on ocean conditions for where they can live. And as those conditions change, they have to find new places to live. And of course, these impacts all affect people in one way or another. Um, fishing, for instance, as fisheries are affected by these changes, people who depend on those fisheries are changed, are affected as well. In order to be able to measure and monitor the ocean, we need to collect data on some key aspects of the ocean. These are variables that we use to measure the health and pulse of the ocean, kind of like the way we would take your temperature or measure your blood oxygen nowadays in these times of COVID. The measures of the, of the health of the ocean are quite similar. We take the temperature of the ocean. We measure how much oxygen is in the ocean. We keep track of nutrients and chlorophyll as a measure of plants and productivity. And we measure salinity, not just to see how salty the ocean is, but low salinity indicates a high input of fresh water from land. And that fresh water can carry pollutants and nutrients and other key factors that can harm the ocean. If we have these data on the ocean for all parts of the ocean, then we can begin to do a good job of measuring and monitoring the ocean and thus managing it. Climate change in particular is a problem these days. And what we see is not a gradual warming of the ocean, but we see more and more heat waves. These are periods of increased temperature, intense increases in temperature that may be highly localized and highly seasonal. If we wanna manage the ocean, we have to be able to monitor these heat waves. A couple of years ago, you may have heard about the big blob off of the Pacific coast of North America and South America. This blob had impacts up and down the Pacific Ocean. A warming ocean is caused, of course, by increased burning of fossil fuels and other human activities that warm the globe. And the ocean is particularly vulnerable because it traps heat. And as the ocean traps heat, that warming ocean affects the cycling of carbon dioxide through the ocean. The ocean stores a lot of carbon and keeps it out of the atmosphere. It affects the cycles of nutrients and oxygen and ultimately the acidity of the ocean. But a warmer ocean also affects ecosystems and living organisms directly. Many organisms in the ocean have limits on the temperatures that they can withstand, both high temperatures and low temperatures. And when the ocean warms up, they don't have any place to go in many cases, and they either leave or die. And of course, changes in ocean temperatures can fuel extreme weather events, like cyclones, typhoons, and hurricanes. I'll come back to that. As I mentioned, the ocean is losing oxygen too. 
Um, this loss of oxygen is caused by a number of factors. When you combine increased nutrients from human waste, agriculture, and industry with warming water, it can lead to an increase in oxygen consumption, particularly by algae. And when that algae dies, by organisms that consume that algae, warm water holds less oxygen. And um, a reduced mixing of the ocean also causes a loss of oxygen. You've probably seen in fountains and small ponds, there would be aerators to mix the pond so the fish and the plants in that pond can still breathe. Well, the ocean needs very similar sort of mixing in order to maintain oxygen. So a stratified ocean often leads to an ocean with less oxygen. Now, a loss of oxygen can impact organisms directly if they can't breathe. And if they have enough trouble breathing, it can lead to their death because some organisms are more sensitive to a loss of oxygen than others, it can change the balance of power in the competition that's always happening in the ocean, and that'll result in a loss of biodiversity. Of course, a lack of oxygen in the ocean has direct impacts on the food chain, and so that can lead to a reduction in fisheries. And generally, ocean biogeochemical cycling, that's this relationship between li living organisms and the, the chemicals of the ocean will all be thrown off if the organisms themselves and oxygen are um, not available in the quantities that the ocean has experienced in the past. And finally, the ocean is becoming more acidic. Increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means that there's more carbon dioxide that's exposed to the surface of the ocean and that carbon dioxide dissolves directly into the ocean and creates carbonic acid. So the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, the more carbonic acid you have in the ocean. This increases acidity across the board in the ocean. When you have increased acidity, it's less easy for animals um, to maintain shells and skeletons that are made of calcium. Acidity affects the functioning of cells in organisms and thus can affect the growth rates, survival, um, abundance, and larval development in many ocean organisms. It hampers coral reef growth directly. So corals that are living in more acidic waters tend to grow much more slowly and have much less success at reproduction. And a more acidic ocean can affect food webs, biodiversity, and human food security because more than a billion people live near the ocean and depend on ocean fish for their food and well-being. Fortunately, there are ways of using ocean data to help solve some of these problems, and I just want to walk through a few of these examples right now. I've mentioned coral reefs a couple of times. They're incredibly important. They have a value of greater than $3 billion every year, benefits people um, through uh, the fish and fisheries that live near coral reefs. Coral reef tourism is very important. Um, and of course, tour tourism has taken a, a real hit this, this past year or so because of COVID, but it will likely come back. And so people will once again depend on coral reefs for that tourism. And coral reefs protect coastal communities from storms and um, sea level rise. But coral reefs are declining and we've seen dramatic declines just in the past 30 years from coral bleaching and disease that's caused by warmer oceans um, from more acidic oceans, as I've mentioned, that limits the growth and recovery of coral reefs, and also from less oxygen. And when you have less oxygen, it affects coral growth rates directly, um, but algae still grow well, and so algae can outcompete coral and suffocate corals. And all of this combined, these losses of coral reefs from disease and bleaching um, and competition can lead to a loss of biodiversity, a decline in fish catch, a loss of shoreline protection and a decline in tourism, all of which affects people. So we need some way of trying to limit these losses. Fortunately, data can help. If we have data about temperature and oxygen and salinity and nutrients, we can do a pretty good job of predicting where coral reefs under the, are under the most stress. 
The image you have here is from NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, which is based on ocean temperature data. And the alert levels you see here um, depend on how hot the ocean is and for how long temperature is elevated. So places where you have warmer water for longer periods of time have a higher alert level, and those are places that are more likely to bleach. You can see over here on the left, um, this is Australia and the Great Barrier Reef. And we've seen that the Australian Great Barrier Reef has bleached repeatedly over the last decade when ocean temperatures have gotten hot. So if we have good ocean temperature data, especially, and we can combine it with this other data, then we can create alerts to know when reefs are vulnerable. We can help prioritize resources and implement protective and adaptive responses in those coral reefs that are facing the highest stress from changing ocean, particularly heat stress. We can improve our management and regulation of reefs that are going to be most vulnerable to a changing ocean. For instance, we can reduce runoff and nutrient pollution from shoreline and coastal activities. We can reduce fishing pressure and we can participate in active coral reef restoration where um, reefs are being hard hit. And we can also identify those places where people are going to be at risk. Because as I've mentioned before, when coral reefs are at risk, so are people who depend on them. And knowing where that is, is important to how we manage um, the communities, the coastal communities where these impacts are likely to occur. A changing ocean affects the food chain, which of course affects wildlife and people. This picture to the left is a picture of a seal that was taken during that period of the ocean blob that I mentioned earlier. In that ocean blob, there was an incredible disappearance of fish, of krill, and other things that wildlife eat. And so what we saw is that marine mammals, whales and seals and, and other kinds of fish, salmon, were affected by this blob, both within the blob but nearby because they lost food. Blobs like this, heat waves and ocean warming reduce productivity in food up and down the food chain. Of course, we've talked about how a more acidic ocean can affect shellfish, corals, and um, plankton that require uh, calcium and, and other kinds of um, nutrients that are affected by acidity. They can't grow as well. And less oxygen means more dead zones, more um, places where productivity is reduced and disease and mortality are increased. So combined, a uh, warmer, more acidic, less, less oxygenated ocean can cause decreases in fish catch, a loss of biodiversity, and ultimately a decrease in food availability to wildlife. Once again, ocean data can be used to try to deal with this problem. Okay. We can identify fisheries that are going to be most vulnerable to a changing ocean and adjust our quotas to take into account that fisheries may not be as robust or as fast growing as they were in the past. We can create new rules about fishing to account for a changing ocean. We can predict what future fish catches will be so we can turn away from fisheries that won't be able to support as much um, catch as they did in the past. And we can adjust our marine protected areas, places that are set aside to help protect juvenile fish, fish nurseries, and that core part of the ecosystem that's important for biodiversity and ultimately productivity. But to do this requires data. Harmful algal blooms are another area where changing ocean is having impacts. Harmful algal blooms can lead to the loss of wildlife but in cases like this, this whale that's washed up in the Pacific Northwest of North America, um, these whales were likely poisoned by toxic algae far from shore. So we need to be able to collect data un to understand how algal blooms are changing both close to land and far out at sea. Algal blooms are caused by a warmer ocean. One of the things that happens is we have um, reduced circulation combined with more nutrients. We have increases in algal blooms. We have less oxygen. We have this sort of feedback loop that happens. Blooms themselves deplete oxygen, as I've described earlier, but blooms also block sunlight, which keeps organisms below them from photosynthesizing, so they're producing less oxygen. 
when you take these together, um, algal blooms can cause massive fish die-offs. These massive fish die-offs can themselves cause um, more uh, respiratory action in the ocean, which consumes more oxygen, which depletes oxygen even more and creates these dead zones or what we call hypoxic low oxygen areas. Algal blooms, of course, can result in toxins and accumulation of toxins in shellfish and other animals, um, including regular fish, fin fish that can be harmful to humans and wildlife. And all of these things can have knock-on effects on people through its impacts on tourism and fisheries. But if we have good ocean temperature data, we can predict when and where algal blooms will happen. And so here you see um, graphs uh, at the top where we see changes in bloom season for Alexandrium, a particularly toxic uh, algae bloom. We can predict these changes in bloom season based on water temperature. And then we can see here um, by measuring changes in mean annual growth rate that those places where we predicted changes in bloom season are also places where we've had increased growth rates of Alexandrium, this harmful algal bloom. So if we have ocean data, we can forecast when and where algal blooms will happen. This means if we know temperatures are going to be warmer, we can manage runoff in agriculture to reduce nutrients to try to avoid algal blooms happening there. It means that if we can forecast blooms in advance, we can warn aquaculture and shellfish growers so they can remove the fish and shellfish from the sea before they're poisoned by toxic algae. And we can warn beachgoers. Just like with anything else in your lives, if you have more information about what the future holds, you can make better plans. And that's true for algal blooms. Ocean temperature also um, can be used to predict cyclones and hurricanes. So this is a map of the alleyways where typhoons, cyclones, and hurricanes are likely to occur. And of course, you can see this is along the tropics and where ocean water is warmer. But the ocean temperature is not consistent throughout the tropics. And one of the things that we see is that certain parts of the tropics are particularly warm. And these are the places, so the Gulf of Mexico, um, the the uh, Indian Ocean, for instance, are places where we see a lot of tropical storms because we have very warm water. If we can predict these temperatures in advance, we'll have a better idea of where cyclones will occur and what their intensity will be. And that's exactly why we need ocean temperature data. So we can help people be prepared for future cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons. Fortunately, there are more and more ways of collecting ocean data. We can collect it from space, from a variety of different kinds of satellites, from aircraft. We can collect it from radars and other kinds of towers on land. Um, and we can collect data also from the sea itself. And our new technologies that let us look under the sea, like autonomous underwater vehicles, um, remotely operated vehicles, gliders and the like are giving us the ability to measure and monitor ocean conditions far below the sea surface. So up to 5,000 meters below the sea. And this is going to be very important because the ocean is three-dimensional and you can't understand the ocean just by looking at the surface, which traditionally has been our limits in using planes and satellites and shore-based methods. Where do all of these data go? Well, historically, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, part of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, has been a hub for collecting data from the 150 coastal countries around the world, bringing it all together in one place so that we can begin to share ocean data, model ocean change, and really create better um, tools for managing the ocean. And recognizing the importance of this data, the United Nations has created the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development that really seeks to transform the way we collect ocean data and use it for ocean management. So part of this UN Decade of Ocean Science is really to working to increase the amount of data coming in to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission that can then be shared globally. 
And the most important place within the UN IOC where these data have been collected over the last 120 years is the World Ocean Database. It's the oldest, largest, most complete global collection of ocean data. It's data from 40 variables collected by 10 different kinds of instruments in the sea and under the sea, collected at 102 depths. And it's managed by the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange and put together and published by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. These sources include things like drifters, buoys, gliders, even sensors that have traditionally um, been attached to animals because these animals could go places that we could not. But now increasingly with our drifters, gliders, and other ways of working underwater, we don't have to rely so much on these animals. This is the data that the satellites can't see. So it's super important for understanding ocean change. Over 120 years, you can see these red areas are places where we've had more data. We've done a pretty good job of visiting and collecting most of the world's ocean at least once. But that's over 120 years. That's over very long. You can see here, this is the same measure of data. So red is where we have a lot of data that um, even over the past four decades, where we collect data routinely has been somewhat limited. So um, early on in the 80s, we were collecting a lot of data around Europe and North America. The intensity of data collection increased. We started collecting more data around the east coast of um, Asia and Australia, increasing in parts of Africa and Latin America. And over time, the amount of ocean that we have been able to cover on a decadal basis has gone up um, considerably. So now there's only really about 15% of the Earth's surface that is still unmonitored um, on a decadal basis. So that means we've visited at least once over a 10 year period. These data are important and people use them. And so what you see here is just two ways of measuring how world ocean database data have been used by scientists. This is the number of citations, um, number of papers that have used world ocean database data. It's gone up consistently as the amount of data has gone up. So what we have here is an increasing body of knowledge and people that are increasingly willing to use it. So why then do we need more data? Well, the problem is, is that there's still a lot of data that's held by countries and isn't shared in this World Ocean Database. There are 150 ocean countries, 93 data centers, and only 20 data centers that contribute routinely on a year-by-year -year basis to the World Ocean Database. Each year, there are fewer and fewer countries contributing to the World Ocean Database. So in 1995, we had nearly 60 countries contributing to the World Ocean Database. But in 2020 and 2019, we had around 30. So all, about half as many countries contributing. And the United States and Australia contributed more than half of all of the data in that World Ocean Database. The result of this is that we know a lot about some variables. So we have very good coverage of temperature and salinity around the world, but we know far less about dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll. So what you see here in this picture is how many observations of data are collected per square kilometer. And so at the bottom with chlorophyll, you can see that nearly three quarters of the world, we do not collect chlorophyll data um, on a regular basis. We do not collect dissolved oxygen in the ocean for much of the ocean. Our understanding of carbon and acidity changes um, in the ocean is even less. And so you can see these white places are places where we don't have any data. And that's a big problem if we want to understand how the ocean is changing in terms of its ability to store carbon and how the acidity of the ocean is changing. What this means is that many large marine ecosystems, so these are the way that we measure now um, how the ocean operates 
as individual ecosystems in this large global ecosystem. Many of these marine ecosystems, um, the ones in blue, green, and yellow, have very few stations where data are regularly collected. So these measures here are how many stations are um, uh, available to collect data routinely uh, year by year per thousand square kilometers. That's a pretty big area. And what you can see is yellow, green, and blue are places where you have fewer than one station per thousand square kilometers. So that means most of Latin America and the Caribbean um, most of Western Africa, most of Africa, generally uh, large parts of Asia, and um, the poles are certainly undermeasured. It means we cannot manage these large marine ecosystems. Similarly, this is a similar measure, a number of stations per thousand square kilometers. It means that we lack data from most countries. So these are the country boundaries called the exclusive economic zones. Most countries have fewer than two stations collecting and sharing data to this World Ocean Database, which means we as a global community are unaware of how the ocean is changing in much of the coastal world. This means we cannot manage the ocean as a global commons. Fortunately, um, we are working now at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for Oceans in Oslo, Norway, which is part of the World Economic Forum's C4IR network to break down barriers to ocean data sharing. And one of the barriers that could really help increase the flow of data from these countries that have information to those that don't is technology. There is quite a bit of data that's held on computers that's not shared with the World Ocean Database. We know of at least 105 potential sources of machine-readable ocean data that if we just created a technological digital link in the cloud between these machines and the World Ocean Database, we could increase the flow of data into the World Ocean Database. But of these 105 potential sources of machine-readable ocean data, only 21 are currently contributing data to the World Ocean Database. So to solve that problem, we have worked, we meaning the um, Ocean Data Platform and the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Ocean, have worked with the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange and NOAA to create the World Ocean Database Cloud. So we're taking that World Ocean Database that I've described to you and putting it into the cloud through the Ocean Data Platform. And this will allow us to begin using the cloud to connect countries to the World Ocean Database so we can get that data streaming into the World Ocean Database easily and as soon as it is collected. This, I think, will dramatically increase the amount of data going into the World Ocean Database, and it will reduce the time from collection to when it appears in the World Ocean Database which is incredibly important, as I mentioned, for a rapidly changing ocean. But other barriers to data sharing are more human-oriented. Many countries simply lack the human capacity, not just to collect the data, but to manage the data and process it in a way that it can then be contributed to the World Ocean Database. So we have to increase the capacity in country to share these data. Some places it's simply a matter of political will or funding. Governments are usually in charge of these data and their government policies that may make it difficult to share data or simply don't fund data sharing as an important part of government activities. There are also policies that are being developed to protect um, the sovereignty of data and these policies may have inadvertent impacts on the flow of data. And there are national security reasons that countries um, traditionally may not have shared ocean data, particularly if they thought their enemies might use this data against them or their competitors might use it to exploit um, shared ocean areas. So working once again with the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Ocean, we're working to break down these barriers by analyzing uh, which countries provide data to the World Ocean Database and which countries are having trouble providing those data trying to figure out what are the specific barriers 
so we can work with these countries to address these barriers so we can contribute data. We do this through a process of scanning the world to see what the problems are, working with specific countries to come up with solutions, piloting these solutions through the ocean data platform, and then scaling to the rest of the world. This work is done in alignment um, and collaboration with a, a high-level panel on Ocean Data Action Coalition. The high-level panel is 14 countries representing 30% of the world's um, coastal ocean who have decided that breaking down barriers to ocean data sharing is a major priority for them. And so we're working with them, the World Economic Forum, the um, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, uh, and NOAA to try to break down these barriers. Now that's what we're doing now. What can you do? First, you can urge your country to share data. Part of this is just making politicians and others aware of the need to share data. Often ocean data is not at the top of the list of things that politicians have to worry about. So if you can make the value of ocean data known to people that represent you in your government, that will certainly help. It'll help increase incentives. It'll help break down policy barriers to sharing data. And hopefully it'll help increase the funding of data collection and sharing from your country. The second thing you can do is become a scientist. And I know many of you are doing that and why, that's why you're participating um, in our meeting today. But study all kinds of sciences, engineering, computer programming and coding. We need people who know how to collect data, who can find new ways of collecting data, who can manage data and who can use new techniques to analyze those data. But they have to understand what those data mean and they have to get people to use them. So social science is equally important to traditional marine science in making these data work for us. Learn how to become a citizen scientist, even if you're not a scientist. There are many ways of collecting ocean data um, in your capacity as a citizen. If you have a cell phone, a smartphone, a camera, if you have time on the weekends, you can be an ocean data scientist. Analyze data. A lot of this data, the World Ocean Database, the Ocean Data Platform, EMODnet, there is, you know, I mentioned those 105 um, machine readable data platforms. Those are places where you can go get data yourself and you can analyze that on your own. If you're a data scientist or someone who understands coding and data and analytics, or you can participate directly in hackathons, which are an even more fun way of tackling these data problems. You can also become a science communicator. Communicating science doesn't just mean making PowerPoints and writing papers. You can do it through poetry, through films, um, through music. We have to find new ways of getting science to people so they understand what's happening in the ocean and why science and ocean data can help address these problems. And finally, you can be a part of the UN Decade for Ocean Science. If you go online to oceandecade.org, you'll find a number of ways that you can participate at a global level, at a regional level, and at the local level, so you can be part of this new wave that we call Generation Ocean. So thanks for listening to me today. I um, wish you luck in this challenge, and I hope to see and hear from some of you in the future. Thanks again. Bye.